So welcome to this uh, session in the Lucis uh, What's New series. Um, my name is Gerard Wiefers. I was invited by uh, the colleagues of Leiden University uh, to, uh, to convene this meeting. And I guess that this is because I, um, I know the candidate well. I work in related fields. We have cooperated and still cooperate. And of course, it is a pleasure and I happily accepted the invitation to do so. My own uh, position is that I'm a professor of history of religions and comparative study of religions in the Department of History at the University of Amsterdam and also work on Islam in the Muslim West. Um, Monica Kolominas, our speaker of today, who I welcome also to this uh, session, of course, has uh, written her thesis at the University of Amsterdam and uh, she defended it this uh, some years ago. And uh, its title is The Religious Polemics of the Muslims of Late Medieval Iberia, Identity and Religious Authority in Udegar Islam, a book that was uh, published uh, in, by Brill in two, 2018. And uh, since then, and even before uh, she defended her thesis, she published uh, numerous articles um, on uh, Udegar Islam, on uh, the history of Iberian of the Iberian Peninsula and especially on uh, religious minorities, uh, Muslims and Jews in that history. She is now at present, uh, she is a Veni laureate at the University of Groningen and uh, in a position called the Rosalind Franklin Fellowship, tenure track professorship. And uh, she still is a guest lecturer, guest lecturer and guest scholar at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin, where she has been engaged uh, in research after uh, finishing her uh, PhD degree at Amsterdam. So her research, her research within the framework of um, that Veni focuses on religious minorities, uh, a field that she has been engaged in, and she now is especially interested in the theme she is going to discuss today. Within the framework of the uh, new, what's new series, it is perhaps interesting to tell you a little bit uh, about the wider framework of a research into Al-Andalus, Nasrid Granada and minorities, a field that has, uh, has uh, drawn a lot of interest in the last few decades, uh, really flourishing field of historical research uh, publish uh, uh, editing of new sources, a lot of interest uh, in, the, in, in the wider public. So the social debates of the history of Al-Andalus, uh, as you may know uh, about Al-Andalus being a uh, paradise for religious minorities and diversity and pluralism. Uh, on the other hand, other views. So it's, it's a field that has drawn a lot of interest. To, uh, uh, last year, uh, a new handbook uh, published by Brill in the history of Oriental studies appeared also, the history of Nasrid Granada. So this may serve as a brief background to the uh, blossoming field in which Monica Colominas uh, works. And I'm very happy to give her the floor now for her talk on the dimma and the conditions of the Christians and Jews in Muslim Granada. Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gerard, for your willingness to mo moderate. And I also thank uh, Lucy's and uh, Dr. Petra de Brown for the kind invitation. Today, I will focus on a period in the history of the Muslim domination of medieval Iberia that is known as the Nasrid Kingdom of Granada, founded in 1232 by Muhammad I or Ibn al Ahmar. And which will come to an end in 1492 when Granada fell in the hands of the Catholic kings. The Nasri King will be the last peninsula territory under the rule of Islam, and we could say that its territorial limits were characterized by relative stability. In the preceding centuries, the Muslim territories initially conquered by Tariq ibn Ziyad in 711 reached beyond the Pyrenees to be later retaken by the native inhabitants, giving way to a process of formation of the Christian kingdoms that is known in the historiography as the Reconquest or the Reconquista. 
The military struggle thus characterizes the relations between the Christian kingdoms and the Muslim power. But the process, process of conquest and reconquest also produce human displacements, diplomatic, border, and commercial contexts across territories, as well as fluid identities in a context wherein religious difference became a social reality that had to be accommodated. In the Christian territories, the minorities of Jews and Mudejar Muslims were given a particular legal status, just as the one granted to Jews and Christians in the territories under Muslim rule. Indeed, Andalusian society, we know, was ethnically mixed and religiously diverse, with the two important minorities of Christians and Jews living amidst the majority Muslim population and protected by a status commonly known as the Zimma. It is often assumed that the basis of the Zimma was late in the early days of Islam and required the members of their groups, among other things, to pay a tax or jizya. The actual position of religious minorities in Islam would have been regulated by the so-called Pact of Umar, a normative apocryphal text modeled after the relations of Muhammad with the Christians and the Jews of his time. As David Wasserstein notes for the Iberian Peninsula, a surrender pact like the one, like the one signed by the Visigothic lord Theodomiro, or Tutmir, with a Muslim governor in 713, seems to parallel some of these conditions. We read, for example, that Christians agreed to refrain from giving refuge to the enemies of the Muslims. And in addition, tributes are fixed for the subject populations whose members do not convert to Islam, implying Christians and, by extension, Jews. Yes, Yet, it is worth noting that the final shape of the conditions of these communities in Al-Andalus and the way they were actually applied in the day-to-day -day relations varied in time and place. And the evidence does not seem to support the application of a set of norms in the line of the spirit guiding this pact, neither in its entirety nor systematically in the territories. Quite to the contrary, the evidence of the different communities suggests that the picture is a complex one, and so were the relationships between the groups that developed over the centuries. Uh, from the long perspective of the Muslim presence in the peninsula, factors for change in the conditions of Christians and Jews are political, the formation and disintegration of the Caliphate of Cordoba in the Taif kingdoms, and the advance of the Christian reconquest, religious, the emergence of reform movements such as that of Ibn Tumart, economic, the stabilization of commercial and diplomatic networks, a differentiated participation of Christians and Jews in the intellectual currents of the time, as well as their integration within the majority group through phenomena like Arabization and conversion to Islam. For the period of attention here, contemporary evidence is very little with respect to Christians, about whom I will talk to a greater extent, not only in comparison to that on Jews, but also in absolute terms. Francisco Simonet's claims about the total disappearance of Arabized Christians from the 13th century onwards are known. Yet, on the other hand, an intellectual figure of the statue stature of the 14th century, even Khatib, makes reference to Christian tributarians. We are in any case talking about groups that were not too numerous. Difficulties in discerning the specific conditions under which non-Muslim presence was allowed are moreover largely due to the nature of the sources. What the 13th century monk from Silos, such as Pero Marin, has to say about Christian skeptics in his Miraculous Romanceados, Miracles Put into Romance, should probably be read with the same caution as the Arabic chronicles. Sources from the minorities themselves and from Muslims are few. In comparison to the Muslim East, no treatises on the Ahl al dimma are produced in Al-Andalus of the like of that by Ibn Qayyim al jawziya to compound matters, Christians and also Jews appear under different terms in the sources, and the links with the social realities of their communities are not always made explicit or obvious. Maybe, not surprisingly, interpretations of the evidence at hand have been divergent and have led to conflicting theses. 
we could say that drawing an accurate picture of the conditions of Christians and Jews here in Nazareth society is an elusive task. One of the possible ways to dodge these challenges and to get, get a greater understanding of what seems to have been a sustained non-Muslim presence at different levels of Andalusi society. Here you have in front of you one of the frescoes in the Alhambra in Granada, is to broaden our analytical lens in two directions. One is to include, along with tributarians, Christians and Jews present in the territories for other reasons, such as merchants who sometimes ended up residing permanently, captives, slaves, diploma, diplomats, border judges, or those who joined the Muslim troops. These merchants, for example, had particular conditions and they were allowed to have churches, as is the case of the Valencians permanently installed in Almeria or the Genoese in Granada. The later had a church uh, in the 13th century already. The other path is paying due attention to the discourse on minorities in the confirmation of Muslim identities at the time. The efforts of Christian Müller have been carried out in this direction. He has understood the jurisprudence applied to Christians and Jews as an integral part of laws governing Muslims and not as a separate from, field from them. This, is, this no doubt helps to make the argument that the sustained presence of Christians and Jews was of importance in shaping the contours of Muslim jurisprudence and legal thought. But we must also note its particular usefulness in addressing questions at the intersection between the Muslim discourse on tributary minorities and that on other peripheral identities, such as those of other Christians and of com converts, and the share of the former in the conditions of the later. I would uh, provide some substance to this claim by taking some examples from uh, the work of Ibn Salmun, who lived in the 14th century during the splendor of the Nasri kingdom of Granada. The al iqt al-Munazam, the ordered necklace, is a quite late example of the genre of compiling le legal forms, or wasaik in Al-Andalus that has its earliest example in Ibn al-Attar. I think you can see it here up. Um, Pedro, Canavi Pedro Canovilla studied the al iqt in the 80s and partially translated, although not the paragraph we will discuss today. He notes that without being just manuals of use or custom, compilations of Wasaik neither reproduce previous works of Masail, they are connected to the science of writing, to legal practice, amal, and to its social dimensions. Also very often, they are prompted by the needs of those individuals close to power who wanted to have their business and personal matters into writing. Forms in the al iqt deal with various areas of law, such as family, commercial, and civil law. They are intended for the use of notaries, but they are more broadly an add to the task of jurists in the drafting of public documents. Perhaps more relevant, they include the relevant jurisprudence to ensure their validity. After introducing the notarial forms or models, even Salmoon gives some legal views, and to this he adds other views, often diverging from the first. As a rule, he does not provide the names of his fellow contemporaries, but the views with which he closes the sections likely reflect the practices in Nazareth Granada at the time, and sometimes are the own views of Ibn Salmoon. The collection seems to have enjoyed some popularity in later centuries, and here you can see the images of two manuscripts in Egypt and in Spain. Let's look now at some parts not studied heretofore on religious minorities and non-Muslims in the al iqt dealing with marriage, sales, and conversion. On the first question about marriage, Islamic law allows Muslim men to marry women of the people of the book, Ahl al-Kitab, generally considered to be Christians and Jews. Yet conditions depend on the school of law, and generally such unions are not encouraged. The Malik school, dominant in Al-Andalus, finds them objectionable. This may be give reasons for the fact that no cases of marriage with Zimmi women are mentioned in the work by the 12th century Al-Qadi, yet 
who among other offices was judge in Granada in his treatise Madahib al Hukam, as Delfina Serrano note. Yet, on the other hand, earlier collections of Wathaik, such as those by Ibn al Atar, Ibn Murid, and Al Jaziri, include marriage forms for these unions, so does the one by Ibn Salmun. Um, Ibn Salmun, oh, sorry, I see, uh, I, I went too far, too fast, sorry. <laughs> Ibn Salmun's discussion of marriage follows in the first place a fairly general division between the conditions of the women of the book who are free, here likely the myths, and those who are other than free, which includes the mustamina or protected. The starting claim is that the marriage of the kitabiyya is like that of the free Muslim woman in a number of respects. An issue of concern is that of guardianship of the woman, which is a condition in Muslim marriages with other Muslims and in mixed marriages. Who has guardianship when it comes to concluding the woman's marriage contract? We are told that the brother or uncle on the agnatic side or the bishop can do that. The guardians are among the people of the woman's community, even if she's living among Muslims. If they refuse, the responsibility will fall on the sultan. An interesting aspect that, ri that arises from, uh, uh, from that is whether or not the sultan should force the members of the women's group in such a situation. According to an earlier scholar that is quoted here, Ibn Zarp, he can force them to prevent injustice on the woman, but the sultan cannot force them if the woman is about to marry a Muslim. A point of attention in this example and in the ones below is that the mixed marriage with a Muslim comes here second. A brief discussion of the issue follows and also contrasting views on the adjudication of the marriage between the people of the book by Muslim witnesses are placed next, next to each other. Overall, we could say that the discussion of the marriage of the people of the book is not new. Not only it appears in works of Islamic jurisprudence, but also in notar notarial forms prior to even Salmun. What is new within the genre is the incorporation of the casuistry on the conditions of marriages between the people of the book themselves, and the emphasis on the protection of women from possible injustice by their community, when it is read between the lines, it opposes her cho choice to marry. Also noteworthy is the refusal to apply the conditions of Muslims to intra-community marriages, something that in fact recognizes the power granted to minorities to regulate these matters and the recognition of the validity of these marriages outside the framework of Islamic jurisprudence. Second case in point is about selling under pressure and constraint or selling something with no legal right, such as a tax on agricultural land called kharaj. The rule for sales under the aforementioned conditions is to cancel the transaction and to return the item sold to the owner, whether the owner is Muslim or Dhimmi without price. The views by Ibn Rushd al jad on Dhimmis about what is sold under pressure unjustly or by way of transgression or if they are poor are quote rightly after. Then comes the question of things from Dhimmis that should not be sold such as clothes. All these things should be returned back to the owner. The same is claimed to apply when injustice on Muslims is done. These rules are framed as part of issues of difference in power and social inequalities between individuals, like those arising from poverty. Poverty could indeed have been one of the living conditions of Zimi communities. Rachel Arie refers to al Saidafi from 12th century Granada and quote in the work of Ibn Salmun's contemporary Ibn al-Khatib, who says that Christians were, I quote, used to humiliation and contempt, unquote. There is no explicit reference to poverty here, but it is suggested if we consider other explicit mentions to conditions that might have been similar for the Dhimmis in some parts of the Islamic West in the 14th century. Hence, in 13.1, the Mamluk Sultan al Malik al Nasir Muhammad received in Cairo the vizier of the one who called himself the king of the Maghrib, 
probably the Hafsid ruler by then of Tunisia and Algeria, Abu Asida Muhammad II. The vizier claimed that, I quote, in the Maghreb, the must suffer extreme misery and degradation, unquote. And he disapproved of the good conditions of these groups in Egypt. We also need to be reminded some regulations on Christians of Al-Andalus who could keep land ownership by paying the Haraj when that was stipulated in the capitulations. These lands could be mortgaged and sold to Zimmis or to Muslims, but when sold to Muslims, the Haraj was removed. The jury's opinions differ on the issue. Some claim that the Zimmi only could sell these lands to Muslims, a provision that Francisco Simonet notes, could have promoted land expropriation. We could only wonder whether even Salmon forms take meaning against a background of social inequalities in which sales by force affected the poorest and were in need of regulation. What we see is that the case of Muslims whose properties are sold under constraint or without having legal right suggests comparable conditions for them too. And therefore, it points to a discussion that runs along social rather than religious lines. Interestingly, is that the Muslim case is discussed following the rules applied to dhimmis. And it, it is suggestive to think of the Muslim case as being mined out of them. The appeal of the Dhimma as a point of departure for legal reason, reasoning and comparative tool with which to set Christians. The question arises whether Muslims should provide these Muslim prisoners with security and give them freedom or not. Should these Muslims be bought? And what if the unbelievers do not want to sell these prisoners? Here a syllogism is made and the case of the Ahl al-Kufr or Christians is compared to the Ahl al because even if these Ahl al Kufr are not Ahl al Dhimma, they nonetheless enter into the Muslim territories with agreement and safety, sulh and aman. The reason underlying the syllogism is that by consensus of the Muslim community, these Muslims that come with the Christians would be free if they would be under the power of the Ahl al Dhimma. This is a situation that simply does not apply because the Ahl al Dhimma do not have the right to have Muslim slaves. But the reasoning helps to make the case. And what follows is that the unbelievers also do not have the right to keep the Muslims who go with them under their power. This element, that of the specific situations at the border between the Muslim and the Christian territories, is to some extent related to the last aspect that we will discuss here today, which is conversion. Conversion is regarded as a contract with God, and hence it is included in several collections of contract forms or wasaik. It seems, however, that we only have Western examples of these forms. The forms in Ibn Salmun partly follow those in earlier collections. In those, sometimes one single form is used for Christians and Jews, or they are addressed separately. What adds interest to Ibn Salmun's form is the discussion appended to it, which I have not found in other formularies about the views regarding the knowledge necessary to become Muslim. For Ibn Salmun, it suffices reference to the inner faith in God, the angels, his books and messengers, and why they brought with them. But what about the knowledge on that? It is, is it a condition as well? Two opinions are mentioned. Well, one is that this knowledge is not a necessary condition. Quran Surah Yusuf is quote, we know that you will not believe us, howsoever truthful we might be, unquote. The distinction between mu'min, believer, and sadiq, truthful, highlights the important notion that a person does not necessarily believe in everything that has proven to be true. Put it differently, the claim is that the per person does not believe in everything that she or he knows simply because of knowing. Accordingly, the ignorant, when he or she, or, or she professes belief in Islam, is considered a believer even though she or he lacks certain knowledge. 
There is no difference among Sunnis about the importance of inner conviction. conviction. While, while the Mu'tazila, we are reminded, gives greater importance to obligatory acts of worship and taking distance from what is forbidden. The correct understanding is the Sunni, since acts of worship can be only performed correctly with faith. As example, indirect reference is made to Surat al-Baqarah, verse 143, where prayer and faith are intimately connected to each other. This verse illustrates the claim that matters here, namely that the two go hand in hand and that by extension, acts of worship need faith. The claim has, be, has been made before. Among, among the examples, we find the opinion of the 12th century scholar Ibn Rushd al Jad in the extensive collection of Al Wancharisi regarding a Christian convert to Islam accused by some people of still being a Christian. In his house, there was a room that resembled the church and signs that he, that he was practicing. The claim made here is that the judge cannot decide without having clear proof. Here, however, we are dealing with a new element not found in previous collections of Wasaiq, which is the reference to the Mu'tazila. The reference is quite late in the 14th century, and we can only guess whether these views were relevant to legal practice in the Kingdom of Granada at the time. Apparently, citing it was meaningful enough to even Salmun as to include it in the discussion of conversion. The validity of notarial forms, I recall, was ensured by the relevant jurisprudence, and even Salmun is quite concise in providing it. Aside, the issue links with more general questions about the external expression of faith in a context where religious identities emerged among and across community boundaries, producing converts with uneven levels of, of knowledge of Islam. But it is also an environment in which it seems that there, there were certain acculturation processes. So a liberal approach to conversion could be quite facilitating for the entry to Islam, as examples in other regions, such as the Turkish populations embra embracing the Hanafi Maturi, the confession in which internal, internal convic conviction takes central place, teaches us. Indeed, the boundaries in some of the group's customs in the Nasr kingdom seem to have become blurred, as suggested from the impositions on, on the Jews between 1314 and 1325, who were asked to wear a distinctive insignia to differentiate themselves from Muslims. The keeping up of such measures throughout the whole century points at social practices in which differentiation is abandoned and regulation is needed. Conditions for conversion that allow the, ma the maintenance of customs other than Islamic and clarify the issue of inner conviction seem to fit an environment with the characteristics just mentioned. Besides the discussion of what is needed for conversion proper, we encounter references to conversions at the border, at various places in the Al Ikt. Uh, for example, questions, questions on Ilj or Luj. The term has the original meaning of barbarian, and Arabic sources are not generous in providing, providing the exact identity of the Uluj, so reference should be read in context. Here, drawing on the available data, we probably do not err too much if we say that Uluj were in most cases Christians, often converts to Islam. The al iqt takes pause in the conversion of the Uluj. The Ilj will be freed when he comes to the territories with a Muslim and declares his will to embrace Islam. The word of the Ilj, that is, that of his sincere conversion, will be considered valid. The word of the Muslim who affirms to have bought or captured the Ilj will in turn only be accepted if the Ilj appears in his documents or wasaik and the Muslim takes an oath. We know that the Uluj were often brought to Al-Andalus being young children and raised among Muslims, sometimes becoming important figures at court and in the kingdom of Granada, a sultan's guard made of Uluj was created. Without claiming an exact correspondence with the Arabic term, Christians used elche or renegado, renegade, to refer to Christian converts to Islam in the Muslim territories, and also to refer to those who eventually reverted to Christianity again. One easily understands that distrust accompanied the perception of the identities of these individuals. 
Truces during Ibn Salmun's lifetime mention a particular condition for the first time. I quote the truce of 1310 between Ferdinand IV of Castile and Nasser, but we find the same in 1320 under the rule of Alphonse XI. It says, I quote, and if he was an Elche, either ours or of one of your vessels, all what he brings with him will be taken. And if he wants to be a Christian, let him be. And if he wants to be a Moor, let's not have him in our land and let, let him go wherever he wants." Unquote. Religious affiliation based on the expression of convic conviction thus appears to be of importance in the diplomatic relations between the Christian and the Muslim powers. In the late 15th century, between an understanding of conversion that can be compared at its most basic level with regard to the initial passage into the new community. Monica, were, Monica. Yeah? Second. Yeah? Uh, uh, to me, you were not audible for a few, for a few seconds. Oh. Okay. After, when you spoke about the late 15th century, so hmm. the sentence starting with religious affiliation based on the expression of conviction. Oh yeah, Good. thank you. If you start there, then we can follow. Sure. Can follow sure. it. Yeah, yeah. I was presenting this part, yeah, this text. I was saying that religious affiliation based on the expression of conviction thus appears to be of importance in the diplomatic relations between the Christian and the Muslim powers. And in the late 15th century, between 1450 and 1462. However, this will change and conversion, for example, of a Christian to Islam, will be explicitly prohibited. Beyond that, these conditions had implications for the respective subjects. Points of agreement between the parties, in which both recognize themselves and each other in the truces, seem interesting to be read together with the data just discussed in Ibn Salmun. The exercise suggests to me an understanding of conversion that can be compared at its most basic level with regard to the initial passage into the new community, or at least that it allows for such a simplification. Inner conviction is an element in the relations between the groups and in the formation of identities. I recall, if he wants to be a Christian, let him be. Or in the al -Ikht, expressed in the Elch declaration of his eagerness to become Muslim. I came with him out of wish to join Islam. We have seen in the examples on Dhimmis that their conditions are not only an integral part of Islamic legal thought, as Muller notes, but also can serve as a starting point to build a Muslim case. The legal opinions for even, even Salmun's forms sharing share to Islamic mod, modes of thought on conversion and legal frameworks for religious difference that are part of an evolving tradition over the cent centuries contextually applied. Their significance can be gleaned for, from the immediacy of Christians and Jews conferring them a certain urgency. Porous borders and shifting religious identities could have raised questions about what knowledge is required to be a believer and answers change from time to place. Without jumping to conclusions, one may wonder to what extent even Salmonte keeps space with a moment in history where the balance may have tipped slightly towards some leniency when it comes to knowledge and practice in the faith. To say the least, his approach qualifies views such as those sensed in other sources. For example, the saying of Muhammad discussed in the aforementioned question of the one who abandons prayer in Cordoba by Ibn Rushd in his Al Bayan, in which we read, I quote, whoever prays our prayers and receives our Qibla, he is a Muslim and has the protection of God and his messenger. And whoever refuses, he is the infidel and must pay tribute. Good. Thank you very much. I cannot hear you, Gerard. Yeah. 
many thanks, Monica, for a very uh, clear, interesting, and also challenging uh, presentation. You have uh, discussed a lot of uh, uh, materials, also from uh, um, documents, uh, Islamic law, and uh, these discussions uh, clearly uh, help very much in uh, getting a, a better picture of the conditions of the Christians and the Jews in uh, in Granada in the period you discuss. So thanks very much for uh, sharing this with us. And um, who can I give the floor for a question or a remark? You can use the chat, but you can also, I think, ask to be uh, live in the session. Who is there <laughs> to ask a question? I I could start uh, perhaps um, with the first question, mm -hmm. uh, if you allow me. Or did you, did I miss something? Did I miss anyone? Oh, perhaps the first question, Monica, to you. Uh, mm -hmm. You you spoke you speak uh, in in analyzing these uh, these documents by Ibn Salmun. Uh, you discuss a bishop. Uh, as a possibility yes. of, of of being uh, involved in this marriage, and I was wondering, um, do you have any uh, uh, documents for uh, bishops being active in Granada at this period? And I, I'm asking this because I could imagine yeah. that it was something that perhaps me. survived from an earlier period and was uh, uh, included in these documents. Uh, but that it does not really reflect any involvement of of bishops in uh, Nasri Granada. But so I would be curious to hear how you think about this. I, I missed part of your question because it was a, some. I think I'm not sure if you could repeat from you. you, you your question is whether I have uh, I know of evidence of documents of bishops act actively. Uh, Yes. So are there any uh, documents which shed more light on the involvement, actual involvement of bishops in marriages concluded in this period in uh, in in Granada? Thank you very much for this question. I I'm not so far uh, in in this particular aspect. In uh, I did not come across uh, this evidence, uh, but I have to. Mm, to be clear that for me that was the first step into the issue so i i think it's it's an important question to to be asked whether whether we have some documents if we have something it's for sure few but uh it is a it's a, a stipulation that is repeated um, in previous formularies so not only that in that one but also in previous ones so then it really raises the question in how far it it was important to be to be mentioned there and it was reflecting a, a reality or a kind of issue uh, who was the the guardian eh? who, who who took this role and whether they could be forced or not or not or not be forced uh, so but the issue of forcing of forcing uh, the community it's very new in this period hmm. uh, <clears throat> the mentioning of the bishops the, this we can find it before in uh, in previous centuries so well, thank you for yeah. I think Natal had a question. Is it the case, Natal? Natal Dessing. I, I can't hear you, uh, Gerard, but I, I assume that I can ask my question, yes. that I yes. can pose my question now. Um, so I want to go further also in this, uh, in, in, in this marriage uh, part of your uh, lecture. Yeah. I was wondering to, uh, what further information you have on the basis of your sources, what was the practice among Christians at that time? Uh, as far as I know, um, uh, for for Christians, for Catholics, um, in Catholicism, uh, um, marriage is a, a sacrament that you give to one another. So okay. there is no guardianship uh, no. in this, and I don't know wh what it was like in in former times. But this is so completely different from what I would expect 
uh, that would happen. So that I'm wondering about the uh, the issue of guardianship, whether this is something that came up in only in Muslim sources about uh, Christians, or whether there is a, th there was uh, some relation to the practices that existed at the, at that time. So perhaps you have some further information on this. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, so far, I know. I know. Um, this is a, this is a information, information. I hear myself I'll double, you too. Mm -hmm. Do you hear me right? I'll, I'll, I'll switch my mic. Okay. <laughs> um, maybe it's that, yeah. Ah, no, no. Um, I, I um, know that we find similar conditions, for example, in the East, um, about guardianship, which, which is kind of striking. Um, and we find the same conditions um, in the in the West, um, for me, what is very interesting in this uh, formulary in this part at this particular moment um, is the question because it is clearly put in a way that is it seems as if there was practice by some woman maybe uh, who um, decided to marry someone who the community did not want to, and then they go to to they they take recourse to the islamic justice that that's what what, what we read here um i do not have evidence of this having happened uh, in, in document documentary sources uh but this particular condition of um uh of what when um this injustice is uh it's made into the woman, eh? this I think I had it here. Eh? So the idea of um, so when there is marriage eh, within minorities, uh, then the sultan can we lost her again, I think. I hope that she will be able to get back. <laughs> it's, um, um, with, so we uh, lost you, Monica. Yes, I know, I know. Yeah. It, was, it was something happened with uh, with with the bot, and I'm sorry about that. This is yeah. I, it's the charm. <laughs> of, uh, of the new uh, of the new um well way of communicating i do not see the the, the how I, I can um show you here in the text but you see under a yeah married to with, with within communities so in the case that um uh some injustice uh, the, there is the risk that the injustice is done on the woman then uh, the the sultan uh, can force them, and this for me is quite interesting and striking uh, because it's fully new in the discourse. And I really wonder, um, yeah, why why it's I I I did not find it before or in another source. Um, yeah. I do not fully understand. So, what, what might be the situation in A? So, uh, so, what, what, so the, the sultan must force them. So that this, in, in the case, yeah, when so in the case that, for example, a woman decides to marry someone that the community do not like. So, but in the com community uh, of uh, the community of Christians. Yes, that's so, what. But it, then, then it, it, it's a marriage between Christians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's someone whom they don't like. Yeah, for example. And, and it, yeah. They don't like, but it's a situation in which some injustice will be done on the on the woman. We have similar cases, for example, in Christian Spain, where minorities uh, take recourse to the Christian uh, um, to the Christian law to regulate their affairs sometimes. So even though they can um, uh, do it do it by themselves according to their laws sometimes and in some cases they go to Christian judges to ask for uh well for 
for um, uh, a ruling that in their view uh, would would be would be more favorable for for them so um maybe but but what, but what then for, for what reason would it be uh so it, so he would be able to force them uh, mm -hmm. if it, among themselves mm -hmm. but, but it's not it's not something that he that that that, that the sultan can do if it's uh, married with a muslim so what what is the i i can't uh, understand what the basis is for that well i think that may, maybe how how i understand it is that in fact in fact it respects what the communities themselves w want so um if it's a marriage with a muslim with each, uh, an inter-religious marriage which is a, mm -hmm. the the community and then um and then it's a woman eh, who is going to to marry with with this man um then they have much more much more space for managing that it's granted mm -hmm. to them that in the case that that so th this is i think it's quite quite interesting because in a way when they cross this this community boundaries um there there is a little bit of less of um uh self spraken um, uh, you know um so uh, obvious yes that yeah. you will intervene uh but in the case that it is something uh that uh that the woman herself wants to marry another christian then uh then she has this this possibility of doing that if if she goes to the to the muslim um to, to the muslim rulers but I, I i totally agree with you that it's that that yeah that mm. it raises a lot of questions mm. particularly about the practice whether and how far this was put into practice mm. and i really don't know why particularly this this part um of of um of doing her uh, injustice and and the specifics of that so mm. Yeah, so it's unclear who's protecting whom and for what reason. Mm. Yeah. Well, the basic thank idea. You, thank you very much. <laughs> but, a, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, um, there is a comment by Eva Lukacic yeah. uh, in the chat. I don't know yeah. whether she wants to say it live uh, or make the comment yeah. uh, when I where I whether I should read it. Mm -hmm. uh, can you help me? Petra, what shall I do? She should indicate that herself. If she wants to be live, then uh, she has to uh, indicate that in the chat. Do you want to be live, Eva? Yes, she says yes. <laughs> okay. And she comes. Here she comes. Good. That's, that's nice. Yeah, maybe it's not so important to see me uh, because it's just a very small suggestion. Uh, because uh, as I try to imagine the whole situation, uh, in the first place, uh, marriage in Christianity at such an early period is kind of half uh, codified uh, canonical thing because uh, Christianity codified marriage very late in relation comparison with Islam. And uh, it, it, what really surprises me, why should Bishop be responsible in such an affair? Which is not normally, it's, it's uh, his, uh, uh, what, what he does. So maybe the Bishop uh, does something else. She pro uh, he provides the canonical dispensation for this marriage. So it's a kind of uh, sinful behavior for a Christian woman to have such a kind of intercourse with a Muslim man. So he provides a, a canonical dispensation. And this is why he uh, he appears here. And this is why some strict bishops might be unwilling to 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 give uh, agree to, to agree to, 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 to have such practice. Uh, depending on on their authority and their uh, their yeah, views. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's possible. It's possible. Oh, sorry. Oh. Do you mind to switch off the? Thank you. Um, maybe um, it's it's possible that that 
that something uh, like dispensation uh, could have played a role, but what I can tell is that in the text is clearly a reference made to Wali in the same with the same terminology as the as the one used for um, for a Muslim Wali, but also that um, in in the text is in this particular in some earlier ones if I if I remember correctly is the bishop only, but in this one it is also the brother or the uncle on the agnatic side who can do that. So I really don't know where, whether then this um, dispensation also would be possible. Um, so, but thank you for, 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 the suge for the suggestion. Maybe I'm, I may ask a question. Of course. Peter, go ahead. Oh, wait, a, wait a minute. I don't want to be there. I want to be here. Uh, Monica, thank you very much for this very interesting lecture. And Well, it's of course a topic I don't know anything about, but what I thought you were suggesting more or less is that until at more to the end of the period you're discussing, the uh, communities are a bit more mixed than in the beginning. Is that true? And to what extent are these uh, these communities uh, very much well looking into each other or in, in only to the own group? Hmm. Hmm. Um, well, we are talking about very very small communities, eh? so um, but of course, if we count uh, all these other. Um, um, individuals who come to the territories and, and the captives, and so then it's a little bit bigger. But what 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 it, I sense a little bit is that in in this period in the 14th century, um, it seems as if th there is much more stability uh, in 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 the territory and also uh, less um, anxiety that in the later Period, of course, the end of the of of the Muslim domination is coming, and then um, the, the 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 well, the spirit is much more uh, much more high in in feeling that that uh, that the Christianity is very near. But in this in this period, um, it seems as if, uh, and, and that's what 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 I I. I think maybe uh, we see in the sources is as if um, there is a, um, a kind of shared way to look at, uh, at the possibility of entering into the communities. So we see it from the Muslim side, but also from the Christian side, a, a kind of not invitation, but not putting things very difficult. and. Um, and taking this reality of the cro crossing uh, the bo borders uh, as uh, something that can lead to conversion, and of course, for 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 Muslims, it would be very w welcome because uh, because Christian kingdoms are m m much more populated at the time. Uh, so. Um, but but the Christians are also doing the same. So for for the first time in in the capitulations we see uh, explicitly being mentioned uh these cases of of these individuals who uh who come with muslims or with christians and then they decide on the other side what they want to be whether they want to stay or they want to leave uh so um yeah but i am not completely sure whether there is a mixing of of the communities i think it's more maybe it can be termed as well as i said a more liberal approach to to conversion thank you very much you're welcome if i may if i may uh follow up on this question uh which is i think very important uh, you said that um that these uh, relations became blurred uh, and that you could deduct that this was the case because the Jews between uh, in, the, in the early 14th century had to start wearing uh, 
uh, signs. So the the, the um, distinctive insignia that are also connected, of course, to the statute of the Dima at certain periods. Mm -hmm. But um, would there not be, uh, for example, external uh, um, reasons for for this? Uh, for example, could had could could there be uh, could this be a period of an increased pressure from from the north from the Christian kingdoms, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, so what 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 would explain uh, the wearing uh, the so these wearing of the signs at a particular uh, period? Well, uh, we know that at this period, the reason why they put this distinctive sign at this moment is because um, uh, Jews uh, were looking like Muslims, and then the state was not able to to get the jizya from them, so was not hmm. able to distinguish them from the Muslims, and then and then uh, the state was losing these tax these taxes. Um, so this this obviously obviously points at, at at the situation in which, well, clo clothing and external appearance is is much more the same between the two communities. Um, and then after that moment, these uh, regulations are enforced again and again. So it lasts. Uh, so. Um, Generally, um, regulations is because because practice is different than what you want to regulate. So when you are enforcing it again and again, probably it also reflects a tendency of doing the opposite, of 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 really um, well uh, going to this situation in which for the government uh, the need is there to distinguish bet between the the Muslims and the Jews, uh, if not. They are losing some uh, some income, mm. so so we know the f the reason for the first uh, enforcement in the in this period between uh, uh, thirteen fourteen and uh, thirteen twenty five. Mm. Yeah, thank so, you very much. Yeah, but oh, sorry, but um, what you say about the the king the kingdoms of the north? So that's I mean, what's interesting about the whole history of Al-Andalus and also of this period is that you see you see different um, different things happening at the same time because at this moment in which this distinction is being imposed we know for example that um, that the that the, the sultan is also taking Jews from the Christian territories and inviting them to his territories to live there Mm. Uh, because they are being persecuted by Christians, so they are taking refuge. So yeah. one hand is protecting them, and on the other hand is making this um, this wearing this sign. Um, well, that is much later, I think, isn't it? No. After the pogrom in Sevilla, no, already in the early period. Okay, that's yeah. We are yeah. Uh, let me check because um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it was. Um, uh, uh, half of the fifteenth uh, uh, century, fourteenth uh, century. Yeah. So. Well, thank you very much, uh, Monica. I think we uh, we will conclude here. Uh, thanking you once again for for a very fascinating and clear lecture on this uh, marvelous topic. And um, before uh, saying goodbye to you, uh, I'm, I hope we are not going to say goodbye because we hope to meet again. Uh, directly after this lecture in uh, this environment called Wonder Me. And I'm happy to give the floor to Petra de Wijn, uh, to explain to us how we will get there. So thanks again. And thank, thank you all for being with us uh, today.